Hey guys, Julian uh, here. I'm actually editing this at the beginning. This is, I'm already, I've already done the daily, uh, but I'm going to edit this and put this at the beginning. I wanted to, before I forget, I wanted to add that um, Friday, this Friday, July 27th, I want to do a Q&A. I want to do a live stream, um, and I want to set up Skype so you guys can call in and we can talk about things, and we can also do a chat. Um, I want to do it for this Friday. So here's the thing. I work until 9 o'clock Mountain Time. So I wouldn't be able to do it until 10 on mount, Mountain Time, which is midnight Eastern or 9 o'clock California. Um, and so I hope that's an okay time. But I want to do that. I want to get everyone together, get on a Twitch. Like I said, I'll have my Skype set up. You can call in and we can we can chat and uh, Q&A and bring whatever you want to talk about. We can talk about rules. Uh, I'll try and maybe have like a judge on the line as well just to have some fun. Um, we'll just have a good time with it. And we'll talk maybe like an hour or two. Um, so let's plan on that. For this Friday, the 27th, we'll go on, we'll be on Twitch TV. I'll talk about it during all my rest of my videos as well. But plan on being there. Let me know if that's a good time. And um, RSVP or something. I don't really care. But yeah, let's do that, okay? Cool. And let's move on to the daily. What's up, guys? Uh, Fubsy Gamer here. Julian with number trace. Three. Eins, zwei, drei. Uh, the uh, the Fubsy Daily uh, having a good time got a lot of great feedback one of the things one of the feedback things that I got um, which was very true and I had to work on it myself is that the last daily felt a little bit disorganized like I was just kind of doing it off the top of my head and I, and I kind of was um, a little bit I had some plans I had some things I wanted to do uh, but then I got done with those and I just I wanted to do more, and so I was kind of scrolling through Reddit, and I was kind of figuring out what else I wanted to do, and I, I got that fixed. I got a whole list here. I got like a like a good progression. I think we're going to go through today, um, and I'm really excited. So let me know what you think. Um, first of all, today is Sunday, and Sundays are the best days in the whole world because they're totally just my day off from life. Um, you can see my hair is not done, and oh, now that looked all funny, um, and not shaved and 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 just got a polo on and it's just a good day uh my, i work monday to friday and then on saturdays um i do my shopping and i hang out with my friends and i just do all of that goodness uh and then sundays man i don't do anything sometimes i don't even take a shower i don't i did today don't worry guys. i'm not stinky just for you um i i don't even use my car most of the time I, it just sits there i just chill i just watch movies i watch gladiator what a good movie. Uh, I get to watch like Star City Open and kind of, you know, watch Top 8 and watch The Legacy and um, watch uh, the Grand Prix and just have a great time. Man, what good tournaments, huh? That Grand Prix was awesome. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the spoilers and so I want you guys to watch it. and It was really, really, really good. Um, but yeah, so anyway, uh, story time. I have a little bit of a story for you guys before we get into the magic stuff. Got in a car wreck yesterday. How lame, right? I was with a girl from work. Uh, we were just hanging out. We were going to go get some in and out because in and out is the best. And we're stopped at a stoplight about to turn left. And poof, when we get hit from behind. And my car. So I drive a really, really nice car. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it. It's a, it's called a Toyota Corolla. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's sexy. It's black. And it has a little spoiler on it uh, at the back. You know, makes it go faster. And, uh, no, it's a, it's a Corolla, right? I love it. I got it, uh, it's new, 2010. I got it when it was new. Um, and I love that car. Like, I just love it. Uh, those who know me know me that I just love that car. Um, and I love talking about it. I know it's a Corolla. It's obviously not that nice. But I just love it. It's just a good time. I just have a good time with it. And, uh, yeah, so we got hit, um, and, like, it hit us. And so we got pushed into the car in front of us. And, and, uh, it was just, sucked. Uh, so that was that. That sucked. Um, luckily, not a lot of damage on the outside. All that really happened. I mean, I think there's a little bit of a dent in the back. He didn't hit his going that hard. Uh, I've been in worse car wrecks before, but like he just kind of boom. I mean, you know, it was hard. I mean, it, like you know, I mean, it definitely jolted us, and we got enough to push into the car in front of us. But the front, uh, there was a truck with a hitch on it, and it just went right into my license plate and just pushed it back into the bunk bumper, and that sucked. And then also, kind of a big dude, uh, if you can't tell, and actually like the like the like the impact, I like got pushed back and and like my seat tilted back like you know you know you like put, pull the lever and your seat clicks back or whatever well it just did that I just I just flipped back and I didn't notice what was going on and so then once cops came we got all that done and got the report and drove away I put my seat back in its normal position and the seat had torqued so like it was like instead of sitting like this and just driving like it, it had like turned like this so that I'm like sliding into the passenger seat a little bit and then so I have to, to sit normally I have like the left side this side like pushing into my back and it sucks it sucks and so i have to take it in tomorrow and anyway it's just a big hassle car are just big hassles um ticks me off but whatever and the best part is the kid who hit me was he had his learner's permit 
and he was driving with his dad, which is fine, and that's fine. But he played on my little brother's, he plays on my little brother's football team. And I didn't know that until we exchanged insurance information, because I don't really know them very well. But my dad helps coach. And so I give them my insurance information, and they're like, Ontiveros, do you know Do you know these guys? And I'm like, that's my dad. That's my brother. This is weird. Like, <laughs> but whatever. I mean, you know, it, 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 it happens. I, I was going to say it is what it is, but apparently a lot of people hate that phrase. And so I don't say it just because it ticks people off, even though I don't really care. I guess I'm a people pleaser. Uh, so let's, okay, let's go to magic. And, and to go into magic, we're actually not going to talk about magic again. We're going to uh, talk about something else. So a week ago, two weeks ago, a week ago, a week ago, um, uh, longer than that, I was talking to this girl from work. Uh, she's really cool. And I was telling her about magic uh, just because, you know, it's part of my life, right? I mean, I, I, I try and make it sound not super lame. I'm not like, oh, I play this card game. It's like a kid's game like Yu-Gi-Oh. You know, I, I don't do that. I just say, oh, yeah, it's kind of like a mix of poker and chess, which is what everyone in Magic says, right? A mix of poker and chess. Um, and, like, you know, college students, mostly college-age students or maybe, like, the end of high school, but college-age and older, they're playing this game. And you can win a bunch of money and travel all over the country and all over the world if you're good enough. And people seem, usually are pretty impressed by that. They're like, oh, that's cool. Okay, so it's kind of like poker and you could travel all over and... Yeah, and people like that. So I was telling her about it. And then some, she, we just got on the topic that she had never played chess before. Um, and I was like, what? I never played chess. And she'd also never seen the Batman movies. So, of course, I was like, oh, we have the perfect date. So, because we're gonna, we were going to see Dark Knight. We already saw it now, Dark Knight Rises. But she hadn't seen those movies yet, the other two. So I was like, all right, so you're just going to come over to my house. And we're just going to watch Batman Begins. And then play a bunch of chess. And then uh, watch Dark Knight Rises. Dark Knight. And you'll be ready for Dark Knight Rises, and you'll have played chess, and you'll be a smarter person because of it, right? And I knew how to play chess. I knew all the rules, obviously, you know, but I, I wasn't, I'm not that great at chess. Like, I'd never really, like, I didn't play in high school or anything like that. I didn't, I and mean, I played chess. I, I knew, like I said, I knew how to make the pieces move, uh, but I didn't know a lot of strategy or anything like that. So I taught her how to play, uh, and it was really fun. And then uh, the next day, we went to dinner at her house, and we had, like, a, like a work get-together. A couple of people from work came over, and we just had dinner on Sunday, last Sunday. Um, it was really fun. And we played more chess, and I just lost twice in a row to these other two dudes. And I was like, man, like, I gotta get better at chess. That's kind of embarrassing. So this week, I've been like, I'm not losing again to these scrubs. And, you know, so I've been, like, watching a bunch of videos and chess.com and playing a whole bunch. And I really like chess. It's really, really fun. I can't believe I haven't played it really until now. I haven't, I haven't like, you know, tried to play it very much until right now. Um, and I can see how people say that it, you know, magic is similar, but it's not that similar. I'm going to be honest with you guys. Like, there are parts, people, the, like the normal, man, my, my hair, dude, it looks so, it's all poofy. And, anyway, so like magic people, what they usually say is they'll say, it's like poker because there's hidden information and public information. Um, and you have to read your opponent. And then it's like chess because you have to be able to analyze board states. Um, and that's about as far as it goes. Like chess I, I'm obvi I mean, obviously, I find chess much more strategic and much harder to play uh, than Magic. Because in Magic, sometimes the game just plays itself for I mean, if you go turn one Delver, turn two flip a Mana Leak, well, there's no equivalent to that in chess, right? I mean, or, or if your opponent rips a Cavern and you got mana you're holding Mana Leak and he goes three Blade Spicer, four Hunt Master, okay, right? The Delver player, they didn't have, a, like, an option... It's not like they could have done something differently, really. Not I mean, sometimes, but not 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 to the same degree. Whereas in chess, like, it's your fault if you lose, right? Like, it's it is. I mean, it, it, because either you made a mistake or your opponent just made better decisions than you did. But it's all right there. It's all public. You're looking at the same thing. And I really I really enjoy that. I'm a really competitive person. Um, in in games and yeah, I'm just really competitive. Like I don't play. It's kind of weird. I don't play a lot of video games just for the the video game aspect of it. I got Skyrim, because that was just a big deal, and everyone was playing Skyrim. And I played like a half an hour, 45 minutes, and I was like, eh, okay, I'm done. Like, you know, it's just, it's not my thing. It's just not my thing. I really enjoy competitive things. Um, played Diablo 3. I got my guy to 60, but uh, and then I'm done. Like, I just didn't feel like grinding anything. Once PvP comes out for Diablo 3, I'll grind a lot. Uh, Star Wars, Knights of the Republic, or Star Wars, The Old Republic, um... I played when it first came out, and then, like, but the PvP was broken um, it, it, when I was playing back in, like, December and January. And so I just stopped playing, and I haven't come back. I just I enjoy competitive games. I just enjoy the competitive aspect of anything, really. Um, and so that's why so I started getting into chess, because that's really competitive. And, like, it's just you against them, and you're playing this. It's, I really, really like chess a lot. I, I'm really enjoying it. Um, but I want to talk about some of the things that chess does that you can learn from chess to play in Magic. 
Um, but how in chess? It's, okay, so like one of the one of the most basic things in chess is that you have to defend everything, right? Like you have to like you know if you move if you I don't know how much I'm, I'm not going to go into too much like gritty details about chess because I'm still new and I'm learning and you guys probably know more than I do. But like so if you move like your king's pawn first, right? And you're white and you go king's pawn up to to like e4 or whatever that is e4 d4 a b c d e4. Um, and then, like, you know, they ma and then let's say they, like, so you move your pawn up, and then they move their pawn down like that. Well, then the, you, what you could, man, I wish, okay, I'm going to pause for a second. Okay, guys? Okay, we're back. Okay, so I, I put up this chessboard here, because uh, I want to kind of show you guys what I'm talking about here. So let's say we take this king's pawn, right, we move it here. Oh, this is going to be annoying. Um, <clears throat> and then let's say black moves their pawn here, right? So right here... This is kind of a bad example. The point I'm trying to make, this is kind of a really terrible example, right? So, like, a good, a decent move to make might be to put your knight here. Wow, I hate that. I hate how that rotates. Sorry, I know I said I was going to be more prepared, and I thought I was going to be more prepared. But, uh, that is... Ooh, that rotating thing is going to kill me. Okay, whatever. So, you see how if he takes, then I can take here, right? So, if he takes this pawn, then I can take with the knight. And so that's kind of the idea behind it, is that, like, and so maybe what he'll do, because then I can take his pawn, right, so maybe he wants to back up his pawn. So what he could do is he could put, like, his bishop here. So you see how what we're doing, this is, this applies to magic, and I know it sounds kind of weird that it would apply to magic like that, but so this, this kind of a burst is very similar to if someone plays, like, a... Like a tutu, just like a bear, just a grizzly bear, and you got a doom blade in your hand, right? And you could just kill it, but instead you play a 3-3. Three -three. Right, and so what you're doing is you're just backing it up. So, so, so now what happens is this is, we're kind of in this convoluted board set right now, where I could try and take this pawn, but then he could just take this, but then I could take it with my bishop or with my with my knight. So right now I've got the, I've got you know a uh, uh, better position than he does here. And so one thing that I might you know so I could capitalize on that and take, or I could just increase my board state advantage, and I could maybe just put another pawn up or something like that. So now he's kind of in trouble because if he takes. Then, oh, now, now he ha has this interesting option he could take, but then I take with my knight, and then he didn't really do anything at all. So he doesn't really want to make that move, so maybe what he'll do is he'll back up this pawn again, oops, by moving this knight here. Okay, so this is kind of interesting. I'm not saying this is perfect. I'm not, like, perfect at chess or anything, but do you see what I'm talking about here? We're fighting over these two squares, and in chess, you don't lose pieces. You don't trade pieces very often, I've learned. Before, like, when I first started playing, I would have just taken that, that pawn at first glance. But now it happens, so I've got, you know, this pawn backed up with this knight, and this knight is attacking this pawn. So you see, I've got this knight is doing two things at once. That's not, you know, which is really good, but I can't attack this because then he could take this here. And so maybe what I'll do, maybe now I want to pull my bishop out and maybe, you know, put some pressure on this knight or something, or, you know, I could pull my queen out, or I could maybe put my other knight here so I could, you know, so I could back up this pawn over here just in case he does something funky like that. Um, I could start to, you know, increase my, my, I could try to start to play on my rooks. Anyway, you just have these options available to you, right? That, that's yeah, that's what I'm trying to get at here, is that you have these options available to you that are more than just take it and move on. You know, you, it's all about backing things up. It's all about making sure that whenever, that a piece had, has a purpose to it, um, in, in everything that it does, um, and making sure that a piece, like, if you, whatever you move you make, you can back it up with another piece. So that, you know, if I move up uh, uh, something somewhere, like, if I want to put this bishop in danger, like, I could put this bishop here, um, you know, checking his king, and he can't just kill it if he, if he could kill it with something, because I, this knight is, is now defending this bishop. Does that make sense? So he could put his, his queen here, and I'm fine with that, right? Because if his queen wants to come take the bishop, well, the knight is there to, is there to defend. Does that make sense to you guys? Does it make sense what I'm saying here? Don't, don't analyze the actual playing of the chess as much, because I'm playing against myself and it's rotating and I'm just, whatever. That's, that's not the important thing. The important thing is um, just learning about how in chess, it's just all about defending things. And it's all about making sure that you can back everything up by having one piece backing up another piece. And, and, and getting to a point where your opponent can't make any moves without putting something in danger. That's, it, it's really interesting. I really like that about chess. Oh, i got a bug in here. Okay, so let's let's get rid of chess now. Let's let's just minimize that. Good. Okay, and let's pull up my notes again. Okay, yeah. So that's the idea behind chess, right? Is I mean, magic. You you can learn from that, and you can say, okay, I'm not gonna get out here. 
I'm not going to play a card. I'm not just going to do something for the sake of doing it, right? Because I, I used to make that mistake in chess. I'd be, you know, I'd be like, oh, I'm just going to take his pawn because I can take it. But it didn't actually do anything for me. And, it's, and, and, and magic can be really similar sometimes. There are other times, it, it, where it's not similar in magic is that there are times when you need to do that. When you need to make them deal with you. Um, in chess, you do that by maybe putting someone in, in check. Because if you put them in check, they can't do something else. Or like giving them a tough decision to make. A, lot, a, lot, a, 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 um, a good term, or a good thing, a term, that, yeah, something you can do in chess is called forking, which is where, like, maybe you, you put your knight in a position where your knight, on the next move, could either take their queen or their rook, um, and so they have, they, no matter what, they're going to lose one of them. So, like, usually they'll move their queen so you can just take the rook, right? And so what their job is, their job is to make it so that if you take their rook, they can put their queen somewhere, like maybe checking your king or putting it in a more advantageous position, Something like that, right? Um, and imagine you can you can do that kind of stuff, where you can force their hand a little bit. You can force them to do things. Uh, decks that are really good at that are decks like Delver, um, where you know they, they do the they do the, the the very common now. Turn four, leave my mana open, and I've already used a mana that gets in the graveyard, right? Turn four, I'm not going to play anything. I have four mana untapped, four lands untapped. I just pass a turn, or I attack and pass a turn, or whatever, right? Well, now I'm kind of, it, it, it's almost like I'm forking you. It's a little bit different. That sounded dirty, right? I'm forking you. <laughs> well, uh, like, if you don't play anything, I'm just going to end a turn angel, right? If you do play a spell that's important, I'm just going to snap cast her mana leak. Um, and so you're, you're like, oh, geez, it's like fairies, right? You know, remember how they compare restoration angel to misbind click? It's, it's similar, right? Where you, I mean, you, you can misbind click them or cryptic command them or whatever. Where you're just, you're kind of forcing them to do something. You're saying, okay, I've got you in this fork. Where no matter what you do, you're kind of in trouble here. And, and, and yeah, and, and you could be in trouble. The difference is, in, in chess, you can always back it up. In magic, sometimes you're bluffing. Which is why poker is there as well, because a double player can leave up four lands, four lands untapped, and pass the turn, and all he has is a sort of war and peace in his hand, and like two other lands or something, and then the other player needs to play into it. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about making them have mana lake and um, things like that. Anyway, so I'm learning a lot about chess. I've been uh, reading a lot about it and about the strategy, um, and I really, really like it. I'm going to play it more. If anyone wants to play chess on chess.com, I'll play you. Uh, you'll probably crush me, but um, I've won one and I've lost. I don't know ten. <laughs> Oh, I'm so bad at chess. Um, but I want to get better. I really, I'm really enjoying it. Um, okay, let's move on. Let's talk about magic magic now. So we're going to talk about some basic strategies, and then we're going to move into some more advanced strategies. Um, and and we're going to talk about... And then we're going to go into even some more specifics with Delver, a little bit of Red Green, um, some Naya. But uh, I want to start with some very basic things that, that even as new players, people should be doing. One of the most obvious things is you should attack, usually before you do anything else um, in your turn. And I, I talked about that in the video last time, last week, or uh, the other day, where I'm going to get my drink. Look, I got my bowl. I know you guys love story time, so I'm going to give you another weird story time. Because right? I got all these quirky things about me. Like, for example, like when I change the volume in my car, it's got to stay on like intervals of 5. You know, 5 or 10 or 15 or 20. Or, it can't be on like 18. Uh, I have to fix it. It, it. Weird things like that, right? So another thing that's weird about me is like drinking bottled water. I can taste the difference in the water. Can you get, I hate drinking water, by the way. I, I, I taste gross, and well, that's why I'm so overweight, right? But, like, this this water is, like, one of the only waters I'll drink. I, don't, I can't offend that. I can't explain it. It's like Bill O'Reilly can't explain that, right? I just, I have no idea, but that's, like, the only water. But anyways, I got my Red Bull, I got my water. Ah. And I got this all wet. And so, yeah, so in the last video, I talked about how, unless what you're doing, unless what you're going to do, is going to be immediately advantageous to that combat step, um, probably just don't do anything. So, for example, here's an example of something that would be advantageous. Your opponent taps out, okay, and you're playing Delver. And the reason I talk so much about Delver is because I play Delver a lot, right? So you're playing Delver. Your opponent taps out on turn four. He passes the turn to you. You untap. You have four lands in play. You have a land and a sort of war piece in your hand, and you have a Delver that's flipped, and he has no blockers, or, like, white blockers. So you should play a land, tap him, it could that sort of one piece, wham, swing. You should do that. That's a good thing. Thumbs up. Most of the time. Unless there's an obvious, like you have an ancient graduate, unless there's something obvious, right? But you should just, they're all tapped out, they're nothing else, you should do that. What if you have instead Snapcaster Mage with a Ponder in the graveyard? Don't do anything right now. Just attack first. And then let them do whatever they're going to do, if they're going to do anything at all during combat. 
then play your then do your Snapcaster Mage. Even if they're tapped out and you have zero cards in their hand, you should get into the habit of attacking and then playing your and then doing your things. So why? So why does that matter, right? If my if my opponent has five cards and he has six mana untapped, and you attack and then and then do your spells, makes sense. What if he has zero cards in hand and he's tapped out? You should still do that because it, sh it doesn't give your opponent extra information. It doesn't tell your opponent, oh, I'm only going to do this if I have something to play after. You just always attack first. You just always, always attack first unless you have something that's going to help that combat step. Um, it, it's just a good habit to get into. Attack, then do your everything else that you're going to do for the turn. I don't know if that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. You should just do that. Um, another good thing to do is to save things for the end of people's turn. Right? Like, so, for example, if I'm going to Thought Scar myself, if I don't need something right then... If I need to hit my land drop, I'm going to Thought Scar right then, right? If I don't, if I just want to get some card advantage, um, and maybe I have three mana open, and I have a mana leak and a Thought Scar, I'll just do it all at the end of their turn. There's no, there's no reason not to do that at the end of their turn. You gain nothing if you don't need something specific from doing it then, during your turn. So you leave all the mana untapped, you pass the turn, and what it does is, even if you don't have more things to do, it makes them a little more nervous. If they, pay, if they cast a Hunt Master, you mana leak, and you still have one mana open, maybe they think you have a Vapor Snag. Right? And so they're not going to do something else that they would do. They're not going to attack with their golem. I don't know. Right? They're not going to do something. And so this leaves you options. You always, if you, it, you should almost always, this is kind of the combat thing, almost always play things at the end of people's turns. Unless there's something strictly advantageous to doing it right now. Um, that's why the whole Delver, Restoration, Angel, Mana Leak with Snapcaster is so potent. Because if you don't do anything, because if you just, if they're just tapped out and you just slam that Restoration Angel during your turn, then... Oh, good job. They're now, they're not, now they have a free turn, right? If you don't have Snapcaster Mana Leak in your hand, and you just pass the turn and do the Angel at the end of their turn instead, it just gives them less options. It makes them a little more worried. Then you can play that and then untap and do more things. Now, at the same time, there are certain times when you want to do things not at the end of their turn. Um, a good example might be during upkeep doing something. Now, the reason you would do something during their upkeep as opposed to doing it during their turn, or during at the end of their turn, there's a couple of reasons why, right? But the biggest thing to note is, especially if you're playing against a deck with mana leaks, is you only do that thing during their upkeep if you don't mind if it doesn't actually resolve. And here's, here's my example, right? It's turn two. They are, or you're passing, so they can start their turn three, right? And you want to Vapor Snake their Delver of Secrets. So a really great time to do that is during their upkeep. Because they untap, right? It's their upkeep. They haven't drawn a card yet. If you cast Vapor Snag right then, then one of two things is going to happen. Either their Delver is going to go back into their hand, and they lose that damage, and they have to tap mana to play it back. Or not, but they don't have that creature in their play. Or they're going to mana leak it. And they've tapped mana during their turn to mana leak it. So now you have something, whatever, you, then you can untap and just slam your Geist. So you don't actually care. Well, you do care, but you don't super care if that Delver of Secrets gets back in their hand, or if, they, or if it doesn't because they mana leak it. Now, something critical, I wouldn't... Mm, let's say you have a Gut Shot in your hand, right? I, don't, I wouldn't Gut Shot their Delver on their upkeep. Because Gut Shot, you want to kill that Delver, right? If, and if they mana leak that, and then you just didn't do anything at all. It, that's, it's kind of a tough... Man, it's really hard to explain. It's really hard to explain. I have it written here, but it's just... Man, just tricky to be in that situation and to understand that something like a gut shot you should do when they're tapped out, and you should just kill that thing. Because gut shot has a different purpose, right? Gut shot is just killing it. You want it gone forever. Whereas vapor snag, you, you, it's going to come back, right? Unless you're using vapor snag to like do a combat trick or, or to temple them out, which is what that you're doing, right? Then you're templing them out, right? Um, but with vapor snag, it's like I said, upkeep means you don't care if it resolves or not. Well, you do, but not as much. Um, end of turn is something like where you really want that to resolve. Or you need them to tap out so you can do something better during your turn. Um, something like maybe Angel to flicker your Snapcaster Mage to get a gut shot back. Something like that you can maybe do at the end of their turn because you sh you know do whatever you want them to tap out if you have a better play on turn on you know the, uh, during your turn. Um, does that make sense? I don't know. If I, I wish I could have like I wish I could have people like right there and right there. They would tell me like, yeah you no that didn't make any sense at all. So that I could, so that I can explain it better. Uh, but that's that's the biggest thing is you do it during their upkeep. Um, if you want, if, if you don't 100% mind if it resolves, but you want them to at least interact with you somehow, and they have less mana to do whatever they were going to do. So with that Delver situation, right, if you Vapor Sank their Delver during their upkeep, and they have a Mana Leak and a Geist of Saint draft in their hand, they have to decide now, you know, do I want to save my Delver of Secrets 
So I'm coming back into my hand, save that point of damage mana leak now. Oh, but I'm not care. Do I want to you know pick it up and put the guy, and then you'll know, be able to play Geist. But maybe I've got two more mana open or something, and, and I could mana leak the Geist, and you know, so just have more options. Whereas if I do it during my turn, and I vapor snag it, then they'll just mana, then they just mana leak it, you know, and then they untap and play their Geist or whatever. The, the, do you see that it just leaves them less options if you do it during their upkeep? But if you absolutely, if it's critical that a spell resolves, do it at the best time to do it. Don't just do it during their upkeep because you can. Do it during the best time to do it, um, which is usually the end of their turn if it's instant. Um, okay, let's look at this here. Oh, when to be aggressive. This is something that I need to get better at. Um, at, the, at the Vegas PTQ, when I lost in the top eight to that Naya deck, the, I, I wasn't sure what I was doing wrong. Right, I, I, it was very tricky for me. I was like, I don't know what's going on. He's just over. He's just he's just playing blaze blasters into hunt masters and the hunt masters and oh, just filling up the board and it feels impossible. And then I watched my teammate play against him. Now, my, now I'll be honest, the guy didn't have as good of a draw against my teammate as he did against me. Um, and my teammate was able to beat him. But the one thing my teammate did is like he would just slam that sort of war and piece like as soon as he could, and then equip it and just start going to town. And I wasn't doing that as much. If it was turn three and I had a sword and a mana leak in my hand, I usually just didn't play this. I usually just didn't play the sword, held the mana leak, and I got punished for it. One time I had two leaks in my hand, and it was turn, and I just passed on with two on turn two. So, and, and I just probed, so he didn't have any caverns in his hand, and he had like, you know, two blade spicers or something. And he ripped the cavern and just punished me. I didn't end up doing anything that game. It was turn three. And I could have put a sword, is the moral of the story. And instead I held the mana leak, and then he ripped the cavern and just, and just won, just crushed me. So, being more aggressive. Is really important. There are times. How many times? How many times have you guys ever had an opponent at one life, one life, and you can't kill him, and maybe you finally end up killing him, or maybe they make a comeback, right? If your opponent's at one life, there's a really good chance you messed up somewhere, right? If it's maybe not attacking, maybe you didn't attack with that Delver because they didn't, or the Elf, you know, if you're playing red green, or the Abyssin's Pilgrim, or maybe you didn't attack with your Blade Splicer, just a Golem token. Somewhere, usually you've messed up, and you didn't do something quite right. You should definitely be aggressive, um, and and going with being aggressive, you should make them have the answers you think they have most of the time. Now, if your hand, if you're playing red green and your hand is three lands and a hunt master, right, and and you, they leave mana open, maybe don't play your hunt master there, right, because you don't want to get mana leaked. But if you've got like blade splicer, hunt master, restoration angel, and birthing pot in your hand, and you got four mana. Just do it. Just start slamming those cards down. Make them have these counter spells. You know, play your Blade Spicer. They mana leak it? Fine. Next turn, play your Hunt Master. Then we'll go Snapcaster mana leak? Fine. Next turn, Earthing Bond. Right? You just make them keep having answers. And I'll, I'll that. Sometimes they have all the answers. And that blows. But most of the time, they don't. Um, they run out. Especially with the deck like Niapod, because uh, you can start overwhelming the board. Um, and so, yeah, so it's really important to be aggressive and to make them have the answers. Um, if you think they might have Vapor Snag, you know, then make them have it. Attack with your Golem Token, make them have that Vapor Snag. Um, <clears throat> if they attack with their Geist and you have two Spirits, double block. You just gotta do it. You just gotta put those two Spirits there. Because what happens is, I play Delver a lot, right? And plenty of times I won't have a Vapor Snag or a Mutagen of Growth or a Gut Shot or anything like that. And I'll attack with my Geist anyway. Because I know, especially if I've blown them up before that game, Okay, I'm going to go on a little side note here. I'm going to talk about everyone's favorite basketball player, Kobe Bryant, right? He's the greatest ever, better than Michael Jordan. No, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm just kidding, right? I like to say that because it really ticks people off. It's like my favorite way to troll people. It might be one of my favorite ways to troll people. Is to talk about how Kobe is way better than Michael Jordan could ever hope to be. And people get so, so ticked off by that. I don't actually think that, right? I mean, Kobe's great. Michael Jordan is better. But, I mean, Kobe's, it doesn't matter. But I just love saying it because people get so mad. Um, anyway, so I was, I was watching this video a while a long time ago, a long time ago, two years ago. Uh, Kobe Bryant was talking with a reporter, teaching him a, she kind of, it was like a 10 minute interview, but Kobe was, it wasn't just standing talking, they were like on the, on the basketball court, um, and Kobe Bryant was talking about how he plays offense, how he, when, you know, he goes up against a defender, um, how he knows if he's going to go right or he's going to go left. And Kobe said that he has it all in his mind, and he knows how many times he's done what, you know, X against this against this defender. So this is the first time I come up, up on him. Maybe I'll go and I'll fake a crossover, and I'll burn right, and I'll go right past him. And then the next time, maybe I'll fake the cross and I'll go left or something. He's like, and, and then I will go left again. He's like, but I know every time in my head. And I know what I've done to this defender, 
and how many times I've done it to each of the people on the court so that I, I know when um, when I can do or I, I know what they're expecting what they're not expecting you know I know that if I if I blown past him on his right six times in a row then I fake to the right but he's gonna be ready for that but he's also here for the left so I'll fake it then I'll just pull back and hit the jumper you know something like that anyway he talks about that how he catalogs it all away um, and that was just really impressive to me and so I started trying to do that with magic where and it's easier with magic, but it's still in important to know, especially if you're you know in that game with you against that guy. If you have attacked with the dice is in trap, they double blocked and you made a general growth, and so you killed everything and your guys didn't die. And then the next turn you attack again with that geist, especially if you do that whole like you know lame like hmm oh, I got this card okay yeah let's just do that again you know and you attack again your opponent's gonna be like ah oh, crap well he blew me that one but I don't know what to do. So if I've done it to them, then I, I always do it. But even if I haven't, I know that they've been playing against Delver since, like, January, at least, um, and that it's happened to them. And, to be honest, guys, you just you just got to make that Delver player have it. Because, too oh, this is the whole point of what I was saying before. Too many times I've not had the Vapor Snack or not had anything in my hand that helps. And I just attack with my guys into their 2-1 one ones, and you just, you just see it on their face. They're always like, oh... Oh man, they're just stressing out, and they're like, "Oh, what am I gonna do? Should I block with my two guys? Should I not?" He probably has vapor snag. They always have vapor snag. Oh man, no, I won't do it. Okay, I won't block. And I'm like, "Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, I don't care." And I'll teach you. This is like a little bit of a almost like bluffing kind of a thing. But if I attack with my geist and I don't have the vapor snag, and they double block, a lot of times I'll look at my hand. This is so lame, right? But whatever. I think it's important. I look at my hand, and they'll double block, and I'll be like, "Uh." Uh, yeah, whatever, it's not that important. And I'll just bend the Geist, and then I'll just play, you know, Snapcaster or something like that. Oh, I don't know what happened there. Did it stop? No, no, it's still going, right? Oh, I don't know why this stopped. Sorry, guys, I have this other little program that I run to see my face, because the, my recording program actually doesn't show my face, which is so dumb. Um... But it, but, but for some reason it went away. Okay, we're back. So yeah, so I'll fake him out like that, and then like I, like I don't really care, or, like it's not important to me or anything like that. Um, I never tell them they called my bluff, but they usually don't. Almost never do they call your bluff, um, unless it's very easy for them. Like if they have like a three three, if they have like a golem token from Blade Splicer, then they then they always block, right? And that's obvious. They just always block it. People think you have it, whatever. It's different. But um, but yeah. It, so my tip to you guys is make the devil player have it. Just make them have it. And unless it's like a huge, unless you just can't, you can't not, you know, like if they do have it, then you're done forever. But if you're just lingering souls, you know, and, and then they attack, make them have it. If they do, well, then just flashback lingering souls. Make them have it again, you know. And they're burning cards, too. I mean, they're going to run out eventually. Um, okay, so let's talk about the next thing, which is, this is something I really struggle with, which is the idea that, is this thing going to kill you? Um, so plenty of times you'll play against a Naya pod deck, and they'll drop a Blade Splicer. They'll go like turn one Pilgrim, turn two Splicer, um, and I've got like a Mana Leak, and it's 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 tricky sometimes. Right? If I let's say I have one Mana Leak and no Snapcasters in my hand, and then you drop a turn two Blade Splicer, should you Mana Leak that, or should you not Mana Leak it? Of course, it depends on the rest of your hand. It depends on what's happened in matches before. But in kind of a general sense, probably you shouldn't Mana Leak that. Um, because Blade Splicer is not going to kill you, right? You have outs to a Blade Splicer. You have Gut Shot for the actual Blade Splicer. You've got Angel for the token, right? There, you have things in your deck that can deal with this card. Especially if it's turn 2, you're still at 20 life or 18 because you're Jackson probed or something. Um, you, so, like, you have to decide if this card is going to kill you or if it's not going to kill you. I'll give you a good example of a card that's probably going to kill you. Huntmaster of the Fells. That card's going to kill you, like, bad. So probably you want to manipulate like that every time. That's just a really good card. Titans are probably going to kill you. Unless it's Primeval Titan and you're playing Delver, then you don't care, right? But um, if it's like Inferno Titan or if it's Sun Titan or any of the Grave Titan, which isn't really being played right now, but, you know, any of those Titans. Frost Titan. Eh, remember that guy? Remember there's a blue Titan, guys? There's a blue one, too. I don't know if you knew that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you know, something like that. Birth and Pop. Birth and Pop will kill you. Um, you you got to top that thing all the time. Uh, Strong Group Geist. That one's really tough. Luckily, it's being cut down on index because it's not very good in the mirror, um, and so and it's not very good against other aggro decks. It's okay, right? It's not bad. But I'm not saying it's like the worst card ever, but it's not awesome. It's not as good as their other cards uh, in those in those situations. Whereas it's great against Delver, right? So luckily, they're not playing Strength Guru guys as much because I hate that card. You, they, they turn to that, and you're like, oh man, this is gonna suck, right? <laughs> um, 
So just, just whenever they play something, if you're thinking about mana leaking it, and remember, you have time, right? You have time to think, so think. Um, I don't know, can you see that dimming? I'm going to have to fix this. I hate this. It's just so frustrating, so I'm sorry, guys. Like, the screen automatically dims because I haven't touched anything. Uh, I want to go into here. And I want to go never. I want to see that. Okay. So now it's not going to dim anymore. So we got, we got that fixed. So, um, yeah. So if it's going to kill... So you have to think about it. Okay, is this card going to kill me? Um, like a grave card? Probably not. Draws Messenger? You know, it's iffy, right? You have to, that's where you have to analyze the board. And decide, is this specific Draws Messenger in this situation going to kill me or not? Um, because you have to remember that next turn they might go Aristocrat. And that's really bad, too. Um, some cards are always going to kill you. Like Birthing Pot, you just got to stop that thing. That's going to kill you. Um, and so, yeah, we talked about Mana Leak. Um, another important thing in most Magic games, unless you're worried about time, is you should make them kill you. Um, there's a very famous player in StarCraft 2, his name is Idra, or Idra, depending on how you want to say it. And that's one of his biggest drawbacks, or his biggest weaknesses, or it was. I haven't, he hasn't been playing as much lately. But, uh, that was one of the biggest things, especially in the beginning of StarCraft 2, is that... As soon as he lost a little bit of tactical advantage, as soon as the game felt like it was starting to slip away, he was done. He was done. And he just quit, and you win, and let's move on, right? And that's just not that's just not very advantageous. Now, it can be, if you're playing against a control, like an Esper control deck, and they finally go Sun Titan, and they get their images back, and there's been 30 minutes gone, there's only 20 minutes left, and you're on game one, um, and and you have, like, Lingering Souls, so you can, like, jump block or something, Probably that game is over, and so probably in that situation, okay, you, you know, let's just go to the next one, because I need, I have 20 minutes to kill you twice, so, you know, whatever, but like in a general sense, make him kill you, even if you see it, I, I had this experience against, uh, playing against Josh Snow, in like a, maybe like a GP trial, or, I can't remember what it was, but uh, I had lethal on the board, I actually had, I could have just attacked with everything, and then I could have just done some stuff, and, and he would have been dead, he, I, he, there was nothing he could do, and he saw it, but I didn't see it. Um, it had to do because I thought he was going to be able to flash back timely. But then if he did that, he wouldn't be able to do this other thing. And so, but it turned out I was wrong. I just not calculated it correctly, and he would have been dead. And I didn't see it, and I didn't attack. And then the next turn, he ripped a sort of war and peace, swung back, got back in the game, and ended up beating me. Um, and afterwards, he pointed that out to me that I could have won that game. And I'll tell you what, that is literally the most frustrating feeling I've ever had with Magic. It's happened a couple of times. There was another time where I was playing just an FNM. I was playing with some mono green player or something like that. And I forgot about the, uh, what's it called? Fateful Hour? Is that the 5 life or less one? Yeah, we were playing Facial at the time in Delver. And I forgot about what the, what the Fateful Hour part of, of Facial did, where he gives you and all your permanents protection from that color, not just the thing you're targeting. Um, forgot about it. And, and so, like, I'm playing in the game, right? And, like, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, man, like, I'm at, like, two, and he's at, like, eight or something like that. I can't remember. And I'm like, and he's got a bunch of blockers up. And I had a Snapcaster and a face shield in the graveyard. And I was like, man, I'm trying to figure this out. And I look at a face shield, and I'm like, okay, I can give, you know, my Delver Pill Green so he can get past the bird. But then I can't get my guys past it. And I'm like, shoot, what's going to happen here? And on the crackback, I didn't have enough blockers. I was dead the next turn. And my buddy, and Josh, I just finished playing, so he was sitting right next to me. And I look at him, and I'm like, obviously, and, and, and I just said to him, like, obviously, you can't give me, like, strategic advice because we're, we're in the game right now, right? But I'm like, but did I win right now? Did I just not see it? And he just looks, and he's like, yeah, and then he just sits there. And I'm like, awesome, that's so good. I don't see it. I don't know what I'm doing wrong, right? And I ended up passing the turn, and he ended up beating me, and then Josh pointed it out. And I was like, no! Like, like when I have the win, and, like, I just don't see it, oh, man, that is that just ticks me off. Um, and I've been learning, right? I don't do that very much anymore. Now I'm not better at seeing that kind of stuff. But it's really tough, right? But your opponent, it's possible your opponent doesn't see something, right? He doesn't see how he can kill you. I've had that happen to, to me many times where I look at the board, like, especially against new zombie players, and they don't understand about how sacrificing things with blood artists and how, I mean, so like, I'll see their board and I'll look at it. I'm like, okay, if you don't play another card right now, if you don't play a single thing, and I'm thinking in my head, you could do Quit Mortar Pod, you could sack this, you could bring this back, you could do this, then sack that, then I'll lose this life, then you should attack like this. Oh, I'm dead. Oh, good. Oh, that's awesome. Well, go, you know? But, but, but of course, I'm playing, so I'm like, mm, hmm, go ahead. You know, like, I think I have all this stuff in my hand, I really don't have anything. Um, <laughs> and they don't kill me. They, and they don't. They just attack, or they do some other dumb thing, and 
and then I get another chance. Um, so make people kill you. Like if you see the if you see the kill, make them kill you. Now, now this doesn't mean be a douchebag about it, right? This isn't like I get to have some combo or something like that, and they. It, it, it's different, like, if the other they show you something, like, well, like, like you're at four, and you got six, six attackers or whatever, and then they flash, like, a gamatic blast, okay. Okay, you win. Like, that's fine. That's that's a little bit different. Um, or if there's some long combo, don't be a douchebag. As long as, like, high tide or something like that, as long as it actually happens. But, like, if you just, if you can, if you work out how they could kill you, it's kind of complicated, they can do it every time, you know? And then, and it's just making sure, it's just kind of testing your opponent just a little bit, make sure they're, they're, they're competent enough to beat you. Because that's a part of the matter. Some people think that's douchebaggery, and that if you've lost on the board, you should just you should just scoop. But a part of magic is also making them beat you. Have you guys seen that famous video of the poker player? Who, uh, I can't, I, I, I can't get any details about it. I can't remember anything about it. But it was like a $50 million pot, or some unbelievable huge pot. And, uh, and he ended up having the winning hand when they turned the river. He had the winning hand. And then he just... Tossed it and like his opponent flipped. He's like his opponent revealed his cards, and then the polar bear was like, "Oh, he looked at he looked at his opponent's cards and he was like, oh, I guess you win." But his opponent hadn't won. He had won, and he just and he just I don't know the term. He shipped him. He like, oh, I can't think of the word. He put him back. You know what I mean? Like he didn't flip his cards. He just scooped, but him scooped poker scoop. Um, whatever. You guys are all gonna kill me right now, knowing what that word is. I can't think of it. Doesn't matter. Um. You know, and he lost $50 million just because he didn't look at the cards right. He had hidden one. Um, and it happens. And that's part of the game. That is a part of the game. Make sure your opponent is competent enough to kill you. Um, so, so do it. You know, make him kill you. Especially there's lots of time on the clock. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about with this kind of strategy thing before we get into Delver and all that is I want to talk about um, communication. How many times have you guys played against an opponent where they're kind of looking at their hand and then you're like, uh, and you're just sitting there like, what was that? What is what is that? Like, and then you're like, oh, sorry, is it? I like to go like, uh, yeah, there you go. And he's like, what? What did you say? Is it my turn? Is that what you said? And they're like, yes, I just said it's your turn. That person shouldn't get frustrated, right? Like, be great with your communication with people. Like, remember, like, the last, the last daily, we talked about combat? Okay, attack. You know, move the blockers. Especially, like, you know, and, and I do that if they don't, if they, if they have mana open and no place. I'll go through every step of the combat real quick. I'll be like, combat? Okay, uh, attack with these guys. Attackers? And they're like, no, it's fine. Blockers? No, no. Okay, damage? You know, I'll just do it real quick, making sure they don't have anything. Because being, like, being able to communicate is really important. So when you're done with your turn, I always kind of point at them a little bit, and I'm like, um, yeah, you can go. And I look them right in the eyes, and I'm like, you can go. Or, like, your turn. Or, I'm done. Or something like that. But very, very clear about it. Um, and then if you have a play to make, like doing their upkeep, I'm, I make sure I'm obvious. They don't actually they don't just untap and draw, right? You just want to be clear. So they go untap, and I'll put my hand out. Well, okay, right, right, you know? Okay, I got to play doing your upkeep or something, you know? Like, just be very clear in your communications. Because even if you're not at fault, even if your opponent went too fast or something, I mean, like, do you really want to go through all that pain of, like, having a judge come over and having to rewind things and having to interview both players and all that garbage, like... Be clear. Um, I'll tell you another. There's a scumbag, a scumbag story. I don't know if you guys listen to the A team, um, but uh, they have these scumbag stories where people get scumbagged. And I'll talk about it. So my old, remember I told you my first video. I had I used to be on this old team in, from Utah uh, with these other dudes that were really cool and we just, and just didn't work out in the end. But uh, that was last year, right? Well, at this most recent boy CPTU, the one where I got sick and I just burned out. Um, in one of the rounds. Okay, I hope I remember this correctly, right? So it was he, my. Okay, so the, my buddy, my teammate, or my old teammate, he had cast a Fiend Hunter. And he targeted it. So he cast the Fiend Hunter. It resolved. Fiend Hunter is on, and then he puts a trigger on the stack, targeting um, a Restoration Angel, his opponent's Restoration Angel. So his opponent goes, okay, in response to that, I'll play another Restoration Angel. And his board, his opponent's board was only a Restoration Angel at that point. So he plays another one. And then my teammate goes, uh... Yeah, okay, that resolves. Obviously, one angel can't flick or the other, right? So it didn't, didn't do anything. Timmy goes, yeah, that resolves. You can go. And then the guy goes, okay. And he untaps, draws his card. And then my teammate goes, oh, but I need, to, I need this frustration angel. You know, I need to grab that. And put it, like, under the fiend. And he already targeted it. He passed me under, targets that restoration angel. Then there was restoration angel in response. And Timmy goes, yeah, okay, that's fine. And then he goes, okay, I'm done. All right, well, you can go. Untap, draw. And then my teammate goes, I need to grab this. You know, I, need to put, I want to basically put this under my fiend hunter now. And his opponent stops him, and he goes, no, no, you chose not to do that. 
Because, you know, because when it comes into play, it resolves, you target, and then you choose to do it or not do it. His opponent's whole game plan here was just to, was just to put my, my buddy on a little bit of a tilt by casting the second Restoration Angel, just so that my opponent, no, my buddy, wouldn't grab this, fiend, this angel and put it under his Fiend Hunter, right? Now, they called a the judge, they ended up appealing to the head judge, and the head judge said, okay, no, the board state is as it is. You chose not to do that with your Fiend Hunter. Fine. I, you can't argue the head judge, right? Because he's a head judge. What he says goes. But what a scumbag. Now, his whole point of doing that was just to confuse my buddy just a little bit. Just to make it so he'd forget to grab this Fiend Hunter, put it under his... his I mean, grab the angel, put it under his Fiend Hunter. Like, physically move it and, like, make sure he actually said, this resolves, I'm taking this. Because he didn't actually do that much of it, because... Uh, I mean, that, that, the, his opponent's whole purpose, the, rest, my, the, the point of my story is his opponent's purpose was just a scumbag him, just to not get that second angel. And man, that just ticks me off. That just makes me mad when people scumbag like that. And one of those important things to avoid the, that kind of stuff is to be very clear and to be very, and to communicate and to make sure, there's another thing, right? Now, these are all somewhat scumbaggy. You could argue against it because it is the rules, right? But uh, if you attack with a Geist of St. Traft, right? You attack. Um, this, now, this, is, this is true. This is like in the rule or whatever, right? So, you attack, so like your opponent is tapped out, right? And you go, okay, attack. And he's like, yeah, I'll just take the damage. Right? And you go, okay, attack. I'll take the damage. Okay, you take six. But if you didn't like say trigger the angel, or if you didn't put an angel, if you didn't do something, something, to make sure that it's clear that you want that angel, you that angel is also there, then your opponent can call a judge, and he can actually say that you missed this trigger, and that will, you know, the next set of combat, and it won't, it won't happen, you know. And maybe some judge would be lucky, but not, like in the rules, I was using the judge cast that we're talking about this. But in the, I guess in the rules or like in the IPG or whatever, it's a missed trigger, like, and you missed it, and you don't get, and you don't get it. Um, this all started because there was a Star City Open, a legacy one, where a guy played this goblin card, this kind of cut master, where it makes a token when it comes into play. So the guy said, "All right, I'll cast this, and then I'll be done." And his opponent untapped, and then and drew his card, and then the guy went to look for his token in his box, and they called the judge and said, it's too late, you missed it. Now, if you actually forgot, that's one thing, right? If you go, oh, shoot, oh, I totally forgot this token. But it's another, like, to be scummed by like that, where, like, if, you're, like, if your opponent's tapped out, and then I really, and I talk to my Geist, I don't know, before, before I listened to this, I would have been really mad. I still would be kind of ticked if I made this mistake. And you just didn't take the other four because I, I missed the trigger, even though there's nothing to do, right? So it's all about being clear and also being precise and making sure you make all your actions. So now, whenever I cast a Huntmaster or attack with a Geist, I don't even I don't even get, you know, move to the next to do anything until I've got that token there. I don't even or, or, I'll, or you say it. I'll be like, cast Huntmaster. I'll get into life, trigger the token, you know, and they're like, okay, and I you know, and then I get my token and then I move on to the next thing. You're just gonna be clear because you don't want to get scumbagged out or you don't want to forget. You don't want to. Give them the opportunity to have the upper hand like that. Because magic is not a game of... Oh, I heard this really good quote. Or this really good thing. Or this, I don't know who said it. Maybe one of you guys does. But they said the magic is not a game of gotcha. Right? It's not that kind of a game. It's a game of strategy. It's a game of skill. It's a game of uh, a little bit of luck. It's you know, just more than just gotcha on the rules. So just be clear with people. Um, yeah, let's move on, okay? Let's talk a little bit about Delver, specifically Delver. There's a couple of specific strategies I want to talk about here. So, I got these three cards. I've been picking up these cards. I have my Delver deck here. I just wanted to show you something, right? Because I'm going to talk about mulligans with this Delver deck. So, let's say you're drawing an opening hand, right? And you draw, and let's say you do it one at a time because you're like that. And your first three are these three. Guess what this means? You just don't mulligan this. Right? I mean, it would have to be like four lands for you to think about mulliganing this hand. And then let's just look. The next cards, let's just look four more. One, two, three, four. Oh, it almost is four lands. Here are the next four. Right? Doesn't really matter. These cards are just cards. This is actually really good. I like this. Okay, I, like, I want to talk about this hand. Right? So you have Delver, you have Ponder, and you have a Seacomb Coast, you keep it. It's easy. Piece of cake. You keep this hand. So let's talk about this specific hand right here. I don't know if I can show you guys this very well. Now, I know I said don't organize your hand, but I'm going to do it for your guys' sake so that you can better see what the cards are, right? So Because it's hard to kind of flash it and show you guys. Uh, okay. Okay, so here's the hand. Can you guys see that okay? Okay, let's see. Yeah, so you have four lands, Pro Ponder, Delver. This is like a really good example because the next thing I'm going to talk about was, this, was a situation like this. So what's your play here? 
What's your turn one as Delver? It's turn one, game one, of, of round one of PTQ, and you, know, you don't want to play against, you're going first, right? What do you do? So a lot of players would cast this Taxium Probe to see if they have like a gut shot or something for this Delver. No, the, the correct play, you just cast the Delver. You just do it. You play your Seacrum Coast, you play your Delver. It's like the perfect hand. Um, and you and you just do it. Now, why don't you cast that Jutaxian Probe, right? It's because it's not going to change your turn one play. Because your turn one is Delver of Secrets against everything. Turn one Delver is the best thing that this deck can do. Um, there isn't a better turn. And it also means that Jutaxian Probe, seeing their hand, is not going to change your play. So what you do is you might as well get one more card out of it. That's the whole point. That's, that's my point here. Right, you put your Delver on turn one, then they draw, they do their thing. And they can pick up Birds of Paradise, or maybe another, a Delver of their own or something. Then you untap, then you just cast your, cast your Detaxian Probe. If you would have casted the turn before, you would have seen their hand. Done. Right? And then you know, play your Delver, because you just play your Delver. I play it, even if they have a, even if they have like a gut shot, usually I just play it anyway. Because I'm... They're going to, I mean, they're going to save that gut shot for a Delver anyway, and might as well just make them do it right now. Maybe not, maybe not always, maybe that's wrong, but I usually, I usually end up making them do that, even if I see it. Um... And let's have like three gut shots, and that sucks. Um, but you just do that. So let's say you, let's say you, you probe right there on turn one. So you see their seven cards, right? So you saw seven. Then they draw a card, so they have eight. And let's say they play these two cards, right? So you, this is kind of funny. But anyway, so you see what I'm saying here, right? So you still know five, you have one unknown. Now let's say you, let's say you cast your probe on turn two. So they draw their card, then they play these, then you probe, but you just get to see an extra card. That You just get to see an extra card. And it didn't change your play at all. It didn't change anything about what you were going to do. So I always probe. I always do that. If I have now if I have like two probes, maybe I'll cast one on turn one, and the next one like three turns later or something like that. Um, I can't happen. Yeah, that, that was like one of the most important things. I really think that's interesting about Delver. Now, if we take away the Delver secrets, <laughs> I, I took out the top Delver and I drew a card and I drew another Delver. Okay. Let's say our opener is the same, but instead of that Delver. We get a paper snag. You probe here? Yeah, I probe here. And the reason is because your best play is not in your hand. And you just want to see if you can get a Delver with this card here. So you just cast your probe, you draw, another probe. I wouldn't cast this one. Right? I wouldn't, because it's not worth it. You're, now you're just cycling to get the Delver. Before, you were at least getting information, and you were, you know, now you've got another probe, wouldn't cast a second probe. Then I would just ponder at that point. And you ponder into... This and you keep it. This deck is so dumb. What a good deck. Ugh. Ridiculous. Okay. Another important thing with Delver to realize, and I have a tough time with this sometimes, especially in the Delver Mirror. I'm going to shuffle this a bit or do this because I'm talking about some opening hands. Especially in the Delver Mirror, is that your life is a resource. Now, this works against everything. Against, in, with other decks as well, this is important to know. But, like, your life is a big resource. If you're not dead, then you're okay. Then, then, then do what you got to do, right? This is more important with the Delver deck than other decks, because the Delver deck can have big swingy turns, right? Where they can go geist into Sword of War and Peace and just kill you. Um, a Zombies deck, before Blood Artist, Blood Artist is just stupid, right? It's too good. But, <laughs> but before Blood Artist, right? Like a Zombie deck, their life is a resource, but not as much, because their life never goes up. Um, before Blood Artist, right? Like... That's such a bad example. Like maybe Niapod, life is not as much of a resource. It still is. Life is always somewhat of a resource, right? Being able to take damage so their guy stays tapped and you don't lose a guy. But with Delver, like your life is a big resource. And so like there's a lot of times where you'll do six damage, eight damage to yourself. Because um because your games are swingy and because your mana is so important. Now let's okay, so I got this shuffled up. So let's talk about some Del let's talk about some hands with Delver. Um we also do this on the A team. I listen to the podcast a lot. I like A team. That's like my favorite podcast. But uh, okay, so we got this. So we got our deck for seven. Okay, let's talk about this. let's talk about this opening hand right here. Let's see if we keep it. So we have island. Oh, I don't know how I want to do this. Okay, that's just I'll just look at it like this. So we have what well, I gotta look at it this way. It's all backwards. Okay, so well, that's how I first. So when I first draw my opening hand, the first thing I do is just flip through everything like this. Are you guys gonna see? I'll just flip through it like this. Look at each card one by one. I'll tell you what caught my eye here, okay? So if I show you guys this hand, right? I, I see Seacrum Coast here, and I see Delver Secrets there. Probably I'm just going to keep this, right? Like Seacrum Coast, Delver Secrets, you just that's just too good, right? Now it happens that we get lucky because our hand is also awesome. 
This is another amazing hand. We have a Dismember, we have a Restoration Angel, we have a Mana Lake. What a ridiculous deck, right? This is easy. Sometimes it's tough to keep Delver hands or not. This one's easy. Just let's just see what our next three cards are. So we're going to draw Angel, Thought Scour, Probe. That's really good. You know, we just need, we just need Snap Caster Mage and we're done. I'm going to do one more. I was hoping to get like a tricky hand we could like talk about whether or not to keep it. Um, I was playing against my buddy Josh again. I play against Josh a lot, right? Oh, like, okay, I'm going to take a side note. Here's something that's really interesting. If you read my tournament reports, you'll know that, like, like my, my game against... Oh, my sister. My game against other Delver decks, um, I'm really pretty happy with it. I'm pretty content with how I, my deck, how I play against other Delver decks. Because I think that Delver is the toughest deck in the format right now. Like, it's the most skill-intensive, I think. Skill-intensive. I got There's got another word to say, right? I'm sick and tired of that phrase. But I think it is. Like, now the pod, it just feels like they just play their, their guys and just kill you. And But, like, Josh and I, whenever, like, if we're playing a tournament, um, and we're not playing, and we're not, like, like in between rounds or something like that, unless we're playing something fun like Type 4 or, you know, something like that, we usually just grind the Delver Mirror because it's, because you just get better and better and better and better at that, at that, at that you know, at that, um, at that mirror match and getting better at playing your deck because like, playing against Delver also gives you the most decisions you have to make. It's really tough. Sometimes against other decks, it's just you know you just have to do this or you have to do that. Um, but yeah, there was one there was one tournament where I was playing against him and he got the triple Jetaxian probe, no land hand. And I like those. Those are kind of those are called the man hands, right? I like those kind of hands. Um, okay, here's number seven. Well, that's pretty easy too. Uh, we got Vapor Snag, Snapcaster Mage, Planes, Probe, uh, Geist and Trap, Glacier Fortress, Seagram Coast. So we cast our Attack Scene Probe, draw Seagram Coast. That's pretty good. So we play Seagram Coast and just chill. Next turn, play those Seagram Coast. Probably we will Snapcaster Mage, the Attack Scene Probe, draw our Cavern into, into Geist and Saint Trap. Now let's get a little tricky. We're kind of running out of cards. We drew another Geist and Saint Trap. Got shot. This this hand was a little tough. I would have kept it no matter what. I would have snap kept it too because of the snapcaster mage, um, and the uh, lands and the Jackson probe. But anyway, this isn't going the way I thought it was gonna go. Um, I thought it was gonna be a lot tougher to talk about these kind of things. But I hope that makes sense with Delver, right? Because I love Delver so much. Now, if we're talking about uh, okay, let's talk about another thing. Let's talk about strategy and let's talk about understanding the decks we're playing against and how your strategies can change. So I want to talk about the PTQ in Utah. Um, back in uh. Like May or June, the one that I got in the finals and lost. So I, I feel like I kind of threw that game away. Um, and here's what happened. So game one, right? I go turn one, mana dork. Turn one elf, right? And in my hand I had a, a, a stranger guys and a sword, and then some other stuff, right? And then my opponent went turn one land and something, right? So turn two, I had the option of playing the sword, like playing the land, tapping out, playing that sword, to then next turn equip it and swing. Or I could have just played the, played the Stranger of Geist. The whole tournament, I don't play against one other Delver deck, and uh, it was round one, and I just kind of crushed him. But uh, other than that, I've been playing against a lot of Red Green Aggro, I mean, against a lot of Red Green Map, and I played against uh, just some other random decks, um, mostly Map decks and stuff like that. And I've been making that turn two sword play all the time. That, that was so powerful, because most decks can't stop it, right? You go turn one bird, turn two sword, turn three equip swing, hit him for you know, nine. If you have an elf, you hit him for ten, if they're not playing any other cards. Like, it's unbeatable. But against Delver, that's not the best strategy. Against Delver, you want to make sure you have cards where you don't get blown out as easily. So what I did is on turn two, I played the sword. Um, and then on turn three, I equipped, and I swang, swung, swung it, and, uh, and he had the Vapor Snag. And at that point, I was so far behind that the game was already over. I kept playing it, and I did end up losing that game. Um, I should have, instead, played the Stranger Geist. Because if you have the Vapor Snag, whatever, I was playing again next turn, right? It's not as important. But him having that Vapor Snag on my Elf, right, that means that I then had to play land and replay the Elf. Then he had, like, a gut shot or something, and it was just over. It was just too late. Um, and that was really tough. But it, but it put things in perspective for me that I really have to understand. You really have to understand how to play against the decks you're playing against. Against Delver, your turn two can be very different than against the other decks. Right? Against Delver, you don't want to play just a Blood Artist on turn two if you don't have anything out there, or, you know, whatever. Like, just for no reason. Because maybe they should have the gut shot and you move on and it was just pointless. 
Right? You want to be able to save that for when you can go like mortar pod into blood artists. I don't know. By example, I don't play vampires, right? But uh, or zombies. But that makes sense. How against different decks, you have to play different ways. You have to have different strategies. It's the same with ch similar with chess, right? Depending on your opening and their opening, it, it just changes the way you play. You can't have you can have like a stock, maybe your first two or maybe three moves. Probably not. Probably just your first one or two moves are the same every time. Um, if you want to practice those kind of moves. But you can't do that. You can't have the, the same eight opening moves, right? You just can't do that all the time because it depends on what they do. You have to react to that. In Magic, it's similar, but you have to react to the deck you're playing more than anything. Um, and also, it depends on your mulligans, right? Again, if I'm playing Delver against Pod, right, I'm going to mulligan until I get, like, two gut shots in my hand or something, or gut shot Snapcast or something like that because I need to kill those mana dorks really fast. If I'm playing against Esper, then, I, to be honest, I really want a hand that has, like, four lands, you know, land, four lands, angel, geist, and delver. Like that's the hand that I want. I would never keep that hand against a Niapod deck. I would keep it every time against like a control deck. Um, something like that. Does that make sense? You just you know got to make sure that you're that you're gauging against your opponent as well. Now, if it's game one and you don't know, then you don't know, right? And you just do the best you can with it. But they don't. But also remember, they don't know either, right? So like, you're you're on equal ground there. I hope that makes sense. Um, I can't, I can think of anything else as a strategy. I went through my list. Uh, I, again, I don't know how long this is going. I gotta time these things better. Hopefully, maybe it's been about, you know, 45 minutes or so. Um, but that's, that's the moral of the story, I guess. Good guys prevail. Um, oh, I was just talking about the stars to the open. I'm not going to, though, but I'm gonna wait one more week, maybe two. Because the format just has to balance, just has to kind of, uh, first. Remember how, like, when, when Abbas and the Sword first came out, like, that first weekend, like, nothing was different. And then, like, the next weekend... Maybe that was basically. Remember, it was that breakout weekend where Jerry T discovered Restoration Angel. Discovered, right? Um, and also, everybody had four of those in their double decks, and like the format kind of figured everything out. I want to wait till like that period before we start talking about M13's impact. Obviously, Dive Tusk is amazing. Um, but there's not a lot of other stuff that's like that good. I don't know. Like, I hear anything. Uh, oh, like, maybe like, you know, uh, like I have a blue green devil's deck. It looks interesting, like that Curian Dryad guy. I don't know. I don't think he's better than Restoration Angel. Guys, is ain't trapped. That's the one thing, guys. Like, if you're thinking about making tweaks to your deck like that, I looked at the wet blue red deck and looked at the blue green deck for Delver, and I just don't think that those decks are better than Guys, ain't trapped Restoration Angel. Maybe they are. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't feel like it. Um, but whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, but that's better for this week. Oh, oh, last thing. I'm actually maybe I'm gonna put this at the beginning. Yeah, I'll do this at the beginning. Okay. So then I'll just say thank you very much. Um. Thanks for your love, and thanks for your adoration. <laughs> Just kidding. But uh, leave your comments leave below. Um, give me more ideas. And then um, at the beginning, of the, I'm going to edit at the beginning of the video and put in a little clip about uh, something else. So you guys rock, and uh, thank you very much. Peace out. We'll see you later.